What I'd like to do is quickly start with um, some comments from the quiz. I only really pulled out one quote today. The, it, it does, there was a lot of good ones. Um, a couple we'll cover even though I don't pull out the explicit quotes. Um, I did send out my email uh, about the concept of how many and how fast we'll do with um, example problems. That is just an unfortunate nature of the time in the course. But this was a very good one because this is what I actually said on Monday. Um, and a number of people said various variations on this in terms of what's causing them the most trouble. And it, I, I can't emphasize this enough. You'll see for the first three weeks, you know, we just use really three equations. But there's almost an infinite number of variations I can do. And there's a lot of English implied words. Stop, top of the jump, turn around, uh, just hit my target, manage to clear my target, do I hit, do I miss? Uh, so many different ways to phrase the question. Uh, two people racing, they start at the same time, they start at different times. Uh, one accelerates, one doesn't, both accelerate. One slows down, one speeds up. I can just take an infinite number of these and I think one of the best ways to practice this when all is said and done is you should hopefully have some people you study with. And one of the best ways to study for a physics exam is to make up problems for each other. If you can make up new problems that can be solved with just these three equations, odds are you'll make up something like what will be on the test. And, and you can actually practice that way. It's a great way to practice. So that is, that's one thing to keep in mind. And that is where I try and focus as much as I can in the lecture examples is this extra stuff. You know, there really are very, very few. Some of you put in, you know, the hardest thing you're having still is choosing the equations. I, I understand that, but there are way less equations in this course than there are situations you need to recognize. So at the end of the day, I think this always turns out to be the harder thing. Finding what is that implied information, but also at the same time not overthinking it and worrying too much about what's going on. And I recognize that's the hard part of doing physics problems. Uh, the other thing that came out on the quiz was, if I just go to the results, you know, if you look at it, there's a lot of green for the first question. That's good. Um, Non-zero velocity, notice the one that's not non-zero, and this is where you do have to think a little bit about the language, is the case of constant position. Because constant position is what type of velocity? By definition, zero. If you have a constant position, you are not moving. So you have zero velocity. That's one of those adjectives you need to get used to. We use in a lot of contexts in physics is the difference between constant and the difference between non-zero. Because zero is a constant. So we have two very, very similar, but very important to keep different concepts, which is when is something zero, when is it not zero, and when is it constant. So these other three, if you look at, are all non-zero velocities. Some have acceleration, some don't. Now, this is, was just a simple review of the frame of reference idea. Most of you got it right and got the right sign. If you got two meters per second, one way to think about this again physically, if your dog is running five meters per second that way and you're running only three meters per second, are you ever going to catch them? No, you're running slower than them. So from your dog's perspective, you're running away. And that's that negative sign. So if you miss the negative sign here, that's, that's the concept you want to have. Mathematically, you can do it carefully and get it. But that really helps with that. Um, ball thrown up in the air. Most people realize we're in gravity. And so the acceleration is constant. 
Should have gotten that from the book. We haven't done that yet in class, but that was in the reading. Now, this is the one that caused, I think, the most trouble. And this is exactly, we had this clicker question on Monday. So you want to go back and review my demo and why this is a non-zero acceleration but a zero velocity. And it has to do with we turn around without pausing. The pausing refers to your acceleration. If I'm going to turn around with a pause, then I stop moving for a certain amount of time. And when I stop moving, my velocity is constant. It's constant zero, but it's constant. So my acceleration becomes zero. If I never pause, that's the case where I always have a non-zero acceleration, even though at some instant in time, I do stop. And I have to stop. So that's another way to look at the English. And these are very important language terms. Any questions on that one? Yes? This is one where this is all, I apologize, this is all supposed to be in the same direction. If you really, really, like that was the trick you thought, you can send me an email and I might be nice. A, a lot of times, I, I warned you, sometimes on the online quizzes, they're not quite as specific as, as I was in lecture. So you, you have to turn around. Pause. Notice this is an English thing that we translate into figures. Pause means you not only stop, but you actually pause. You stop for a while. Right? If I need to turn around, I can turn around with an instantaneous velocity of zero, but I never actually pause, meaning I stay at zero for any finite time. I'm only zero velocity for the instant I'm turning around. Now, Humanly possible, you might say, okay, this is an approximation. I have to actually stop for a little bit before I turn. But I can do a case that is very real. If I throw the pen up, it turns around and it never actually, it never pauses. It just stops for one instant at the top. Its acceleration is always 9.8 meters per second down, squared down. So it is only zero velocity for a single instant. And an instant is like literally, you know, it's that limit. It's no time. And that's the kind of weird counterintuitive thing about physics. We really deal with these instantaneous things. Uh, the way I interpret it is that like, like you did last lecture, like how you walked and you made like a loop. I read it that way. Because you said no pause, so I assume you didn't stop. So I assume you like, made a loop. So, so like I said, I'm willing to give a little, little <laughs> slack for that. So, you know, but, but this is really just we're in the 1D motion mode and next year I'll ask the quiz with 1D in there specifically so no one will be confused. <laughs> but, but the without a pause was really intended in this 1D situation, you know, to turn around without a pause so that you really do stop completely. Your velocity is completely zero. Other questions? We will now go just to the problems. So to remind you, the problem we um, left with was our police car catching our car going by. Now, keep in mind, this could be me throwing a ball for my dog to catch. This could be me playing football on the quarterback, and I got to decide when to throw the ball for the receiver to catch it. This could be um, a race, a uh, 100-meter dash. Um, this could be a swimming event. This could be two boats. I, I can make an infinite number of situations that are this problem. So what do you need to recognize the key elements here? One is that we have two objects. So we're going to need to know what both are doing. The car and the police car. This is about whether or not we catch the car. We'll come back to that. There are two questions here, so we will have to do both. And this is clearly a kinematics case. In both cases, we recognize there's constant acceleration.
How do we know, what are the clues in this problem that there's constant acceleration? This is one of the key, no matter where you are in the course, whether it's midterms, final, homework, one of the first questions you'll ask yourself is, if there's motion, is it constant acceleration? And how will you know in this case that it is? It says it. At least half the time, that's how you know. Actually, it only says it for the police car. How do you know it's constant acceleration for the non-police car? Because you know the velocity is constant, so the acceleration is what? Zero. Zero, which is a constant. So in both cases, you know it pretty much because it says it. And once you know that, right, and in this case, once you know there's nothing going else going on, you know which equations you're going to have to use. There's three of them. And now it's just a matter of figuring out how to use those three equations. So let's ask ourselves the key clicker question. What does it mean to catch? The police car is going to catch the other car. Does it mean they have the same position, the same speed, the same position at the same time, the same position and speed at the same time? You'll see it, 83%, very good. Same position, same time. Now, this is where, this is one of those things I think in physics that often lends itself to a little bit of confusion. So let's, let's kind of draw this, right? Here's, here's my great drawing of a car. And over here is the police car because it has a siren, right? Now, they're driving along. Right? And to catch them, what we're saying in physics is we're at the same position, same time. Now, in reality, if I want to give the guy a ticket, I've also got to get both of us to stop. So we would be technically at the same speed to give the ticket. And that's where there's some subtle differences between the physics catch and the ultimate wanting to catch the person. Right, so the collision, the hitting, the catching, all of that happens same position, same time. Think about catching a, a ball, right? So here's, here's the person, here comes the ball, right? Again, the catch is same position, same time. When the catch is over, of course we're going to have the same speed because we're now moving together. But that's a separate thing. That's not part of the physics we're interested in. And this becomes very important when you think about problems, which we're going to do really soon, where things are hitting the ground. There are two speeds we will use, or velocities. There's just as we hit, which will often be called our final velocity. And that's literally when I'm still moving. So when my pen hits the table, you might say, well, it stopped. But it actually, it doesn't stop until it interacts with the table for some amount of time. When it first barely touches the table, it's moving with some velocity. That's the velocity just as it hits the ground. Then, what does it usually do? It usually comes to rest. And then it has v equals zero. But that's some time later, even if it's an incredibly small time. And there will be problems where you need to use the fact that it hit the ground and came to rest. And there will be problems where you need to use the just as we hit the ground. And usually, this is the key w word you're looking for. In physics, you're looking for just. Just as it hits the ground. Just as I catch it. Just as I reach somewhere. So that's a word you want to be looking for. And that's the same thing that's happening here. We just need the same position, the speed, same time. That's right when you catch the person. Then other things happen. Any questions on that? So now we know what equations we're going to be using. And in this case, since everything is about time and position, we can be pretty sure starting out that we just have to worry about this 
for each for each car. We might need the velocity one, particularly as you look at it in the second case, we see that the car can go a maximum speed of 50 miles per hour, so that might come in and then we'd need to use the velocity. But for the first case, where we're given everything about velocity and acceleration, and we're asked to catch, and catch is about same position, same time, this equation is our main position time one. So you're going to start by focusing on that. And I really, I can't emphasize it enough, the best thing to do is draw what we want to have happen. Now, at the initial time in this case, they are at the same position and time. Because it's just as the car passes. Let's look at that again real quickly. A car passes a police car and the police car starts and has a constant acceleration. So I know this is, this, is, this is why I put that quote up there. You have to practice reading these problems and know that this is starting just as it passes. So they're starting at the same position at the same time. Right as the person gets here, I start chasing them. It could have said a car passes a police car going whatever this is, what is it, 40 miles, meters per second, and two seconds later, I start chasing it. You know, I got to put my seatbelt on, put my radar gun away, start the car, and go. So you want to watch for that. Are they going at the same time, or is there a time delay? I notice I don't say at that exact same instant it starts. I don't use all those words. So you do have to deal with that in these problems. So I've got the same initial position, same time, and over here, I want to be at the same position, same time. So what I need is a delta x for the car, a delta x for the police car. So this is the car, and this is the police. Now, depending how comfortable you are, at this point you might just jump to the equations. But to finish the picture, we know the car has constant velocity, so delta x is equal to v naught of the car times t. There's no one half at squared. And for the police car, it just has one half at squared is equal to delta x. Again, in these one dimension ones, the drawing doesn't necessarily give you a whole lot more information. It'll be really useful in the two dimensions, and you're going to see it's going to be really useful when we actually add the police car accelerating. But from here, since this delta x has to equal the other one, that's what this picture means, then this has to equal that. And we are basically done. Right? I just do 1 half at squared equals velocity of the car times t. I was asked what time they catch each other. And so t is just 2 vc over a. And you'll get 13.3 seconds. Any questions on that? Yes? Wait, say that again? Right. So for both of these, I, should, I could add another step here. Right. This is plus 1 half the acceleration of the car times t squared, but that's 0 because it's not accelerating. So that's why it's not there. Here, we could add to the equation because it's there, velocity of the police car times t, but it's sitting at rest to start with, so its initial velocity is 0. And that's why I just put the two pieces there. Good question. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, you don't care if we uh, do exactly the way you do that. Not at all. Not at all. I just, like I said, even for these simple ones, I do it kind of this long way just so you can get used to seeing the pictures so you're ready for them when we do the hard ones. Other questions? Now, Let's look at what makes it a little more interesting. 
What if the police car has a maximum speed of 50 meters per second? What do we have to do? Again, this is what makes, in my mind, these problems hard. If you were just using equations to plug and chug, this first one, you might have been able to get. Right? They each go a distance. You do have to recognize that they go the same distance. And, but you might just remember, okay, I got V for the car, so I use distance equals VT. I got A for the police car, so I use distance equals one half AT squared and kind of match. But what the heck does it mean to have a maximum speed of 50 meters per second? What do I have to do? I want you to talk to the person next to you. What would you, how would you even find that? What does that even mean? How does that come into the problem? How does that impact this problem that the police car can't go more than 50 meters per second? Well, that was good. You had at least a lot to talk about. Um, did anyone actually figure out how we're going to use this max speed thing? Yes? Um, so first, you have to find the number of seconds it takes to get to the max speed, and then you use frame of reference to figure out um, how much more time it takes for the police car to catch <laughs> Isn't that exciting? I heard a what. Yes. Um, actually. It, the nice thing is you, don't act, you can use frame of reference here, you don't have to, but the key thing is you need to know when do I hit my maximum speed? Because if I hit my maximum speed in less than 13.3 seconds, I can't do this. That's the key concept there that you need to recognize. So if I look at this, my final speed at any given point is my acceleration times time. So if I want to know when I reach my 50 meters per second, I do 50 meters per second equals my acceleration times the time. And in this particular case, you will find 8.33 seconds, which is less than the 13.3 seconds that it took to catch the person if I kept accelerating. So what that means is if I was to draw this, okay, this is the car that's been traveling for a T1, and I'm going to call T1 8.33 seconds. It's gone that far. I, the police car, so that's the car, and this is the police, in that same time, I've not caught you, because it's only 8.33 seconds, it's not the 13, I need to catch you, and I have gone 1 half A times T1. And at this point, my speed is now 50 meters per second, and I cannot accelerate anymore. So now what's going to happen I keep going at VC, the car keeps going. The police car now goes at VP of 50 meters per second times time until we hit the same position, same time. So notice I need two time variables. Because the motion is in two parts now. Part one is the police car accelerating. Part two is the police car going at constant velocity. And this is why 
I, and, and, you know, if you had a six hour exam, I could give you an 18 part problem. <laughs> you don't have a six hour exam, so you're not going to get an 18 part problem. But I can easily on an exam give you two, sometimes three, depending on how hard the algebra is, two or three parts that you have to recognize in each piece, what's the motion, and how do I piece the motion together. Now, as was said, at this point, they're both moving at constant speed, and so frame of reference could be a good way to do it. Um, I can also just do it what I've drawn here. And for the car, I have the velocity of the car times T1 plus T. That's the delta X of the car. That's that whole length up here. And that's going to equal 1 half AT1 squared. Ooh, I forgot the squared there, sorry. Plus velocity of the police times time, which is this here. And this is delta X of the police. Notice something to be aware of, okay? This looks like our equation for delta x of vt times plus 1 half at squared. It's not. It is two separate motions because I have a t1 and a t. It was accelerating and then it was going at constant velocity and I added those two displacements to get my total displacement. Likewise here I added my two displacements to get my total displacement. So a lot of times you'll get equations that look like you just used one of the ones we had but they were pieces of different motion put together. So if you just read the solution carefully, quickly for an example problem, you might miss that it was two or three motions put together. And when you get the actual problem, do it wrong. So you really got to watch for how many different types of motion are in the problem. At this point, I know VC, I know T1, I know A, I know T1, I know VP. The only thing I need to find is T. I don't need any other equations. I'm done. And T is 12.5 seconds. So, how long does it take the police car, in this case, to catch the speeding car? What is it? 8.33? 20.83. You got to add the, the 8 and the 12, okay, and you get basically 20.8 seconds. You add the T1 and the T because it's that whole time. Any questions on that? <coughs> this is a really important kind of problem. Excellent. I can see we all understand perfectly. Uh, which, which brings us Oh wait, we did that, we did that, yes. Which brings us to our next all-important clicker question. So, I don't actually have a ball today. Okay, you're answering before you even see the, 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 the situation. Um, let's see, what will I drop? I'll go ahead and drop my keys. Okay, I'm going to drop the piece of paper, I'm going to drop my keys, I'm going to drop them at the same time, and the question is, which hits the ground first? So what, what we're doing, just so you know, we did motion in one dimension just moving around. We're now going to do motion with gravity in one dimension, and then we move to projectile motion in full two dimensions. So this is our, now we're moving up and down, just straight up and down, no sideways motion. And our question is, which hits the ground first? Interesting. So we have, uh, nobody thinks the paper except for two people. That's pretty good. Um, one person. Um, again, going with E. Uh, we've got 30% going with the, with the keys or the ball first. 26% same time. Um, and then a bunch with D. Interesting. Uh, not enough information. You're a very smart class. I've never had this before. I may, you know, have to pass all of you. Um, because I could do this. And they hit at the same time. But I could have done this. And the keys hit first. And I didn't tell you which I was going to do. OK? So what was I missing there? What piece of key information was missing? Whether we were going to ignore air resistance or not. 
we are always going to ignore air resistance. So in this class, near Earth, at least I think we're always going to ignore air resistance. I can't think of a problem. If we're not ignoring air resistance, it'll tell you. But near the Earth, we have an acceleration due to gravity. of 9.8 meters per second squared toward the Earth's surface, which we usually call down. Notice I'm not calling it positive or negative because you can pick your coordinate system so it goes either way. In on the exams, and on things I do and in your discussion section, we're going to call that 10 meters per second squared because we don't like dealing with the 9.8. Um, uh, um, mastering physics, most of the time you might get away with 10, but you may want to just use 9.8 to be safe. Just depends how many calculations are involved with it, whether or not the 10 will round you off too much. Uh, so I would recommend on mastering physics, unless it says use 10 explicitly, go ahead and use 9.8. We call this G. Very useful because you will talk about acceleration. Excel. That's not even close to explaining acceleration, right? Acceleration. We might say, you know, three G's. Well, that's 3 times g, or 30 meters per second squared. Just some language issues there that you want to get used to. Now, having said that, let's do probably one of the more complicated problems we're going to do in class. Mm. Oops. Basketball game. So here what we're doing, um, again to visualize for yourself, is there's the referee with the basketball. They're going to be throwing it up in the air. They throw it up in the air and I have to jump and hit it. You wanted more demos, that's a good lecture demo right there. <laughs> so you have to imagine the basketball being thrown and then the person jumping, look at that vertical height. Um, we Denons are really known for our jump. And we got to get the tip off. Now, there's a couple of important things in here. And one of the big ones is top of his jump. So we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean? So we have our third clicker question. What does it mean to be at the top of the jump. Did it start? Yes. So you must find the maximum height by using the derivative, because that's how we find maximum and minimum of functions. The acceleration is zero, the displacement is zero, the speed in the vertical direction is zero, and the velocity is zero. So I'll let you revote if you want. Do not think 1D only. This is in preparation for any flying object question. So I put that up because obviously we're having trouble deciding between speed in the vertical direction and velocity. That's obviously because I overlooked on the quiz yesterday that I just showed you this morning, so many people pointed out, to specify that that was 1D. Right, top of our jump is when our vertical component of our velocity or our speed in the vertical direction goes zero. Because, I'll try not to hit the people over at that end, when I throw my pe this pen, which is not mine, was just here, so I'm happy to throw it across the room, right? It had a top of its motion, but it was always moving that way. Its velocity never went to zero, but it still had a highest point. It still had a top of its motion. And the top of the motion is exactly when the speed in the vertical direction is zero. Yes? Isn't speed a scalar? That is a great question, and the way we use our language, and that's why this isn't a clicker question where you don't lose points for getting it wrong. 
when I use speed in a direction, I'm referring to the magnitude of that component of the velocity in that direction. And so I'm perfectly allowed to use that. Because when I write things, so we're going to do this more on Friday, but let me actually do it now real quickly because of that question. I like that question. When I have a vo velocity or some vector and I have more than one direction, I'm moving in more than one dimension, right? I then have components. I have a velocity in the x direction and a velocity in the y direction. And both of these still have a direction because this can go right or left and this can go up or down. But they also both have a magnitude. And so we will use speed in some direction to talk about the magnitude of the velocity in that direction, just like we talk about speed as the overall magnitude of the velocity. And when we're worried about it being zero, we're fine, because zero is zero whether you're going right, left, up, or down. If I was talking about the speed in the vertical direction at some other point, say being two meters per second, I then would also have to tell you my moving up or down to give you the full velocity in the vertical direction. Does that help? Excellent. So going back to our problem, there's a lot in here that it really helps to draw out and make pictures for. So we have the ball is at some height above the ground. It has an initial speed of 9 meters per second. The player can jump with an initial speed of 3.5 meters per second. His hand, which is going to hit the ball, is at some initial height above the ground. What is the one thing that is not mentioned or given anywhere in the problem that we know they both have? Gravity. gravity, acceleration. If I am playing basketball, unless I'm playing it in outer space, right, any sort of normal situation, if I have a roller coaster, if I have a sporting event going on, if I have car chases, if I have rocket launchers near the Earth's surface, if I've um, got uh, an airplane flying in the atmosphere, any of these things, gravity is there. It is just part of the Earth. It's part of our real experience. So if I don't tell you gravity is there, it's still there. If I tell you you are out in outer space and can ignore gravity, or you are on Jupiter, so gravity is different, or you're on the moon, then you have to use the gravity relevant to that situation. But I would tell you explicitly. So again, this goes back, this is why the theme of today was so well summed up by that first quiz quote, implied information. You have to recognize that most basketball games are played on Earth, at least as far as we know. We haven't yet discovered the um, extra solar basketball game. We're looking for it. That would be fun. Um, now, so all of our information, therefore, is about positions, speeds, initial speeds, and our question is one of time. How long must the player delay his jump so that there is a collision, right? Something happens at the same position, same time. If we're hitting the ball, we've got our same position, same time. So even though we've learned only constant acceleration <laughs> problems up to now, so you knew this had to be constant acceleration, later in the class, after we've learned energy and momentum and force and other things, some of the signs that this is going to be a constant acceleration is that you're looking for time. Often that's a key thing. If, you're, if you have motion that's constant acceleration and time is involved, <coughs> you may need to use other ideas as part of the problem, but almost always somewhere in it you will use your equations of constant acceleration. So that's a big, big thing to look for. Any questions on getting it set up? So let's start solving it. The first thing you really want is some sort of picture, as I said. And I like going right to one of these vector diagrams. So there's the ball, and there's the player. The ball starts here at t equals 0. It's one and a half meters off the ground. The ball then travels for some time. It's traveling while I am, 
delaying my jump. We'll call that T sub D. So I start defining my variables. T sub D is my delay time. And if you remember from the question, this is what I want to find. How long do I delay before I jump to hit the ball? Then the person jumps, so I keep moving for some other time. Now, notice this is all a displacement picture. One thing that's very important to think about this is going to be a little hard to show because I can't really stop the pen. I'll, I'll try and do it. Let's, you know, so if I want the pen to have a displacement from here to my top hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, challenged this way. There, okay, it went from here to here. That's its displacement. Are there other ways it could get from here to here? Give me at least one other way it can get from here to here. I could throw it higher and let it come back down, right? Those two motions have the same total displacement, even though they're different motions. So the ball could either, right, if this is the path of the ball, notice it could either be this part that gives me the displacement, or this part. And they're different times, right? This is sometime T1, this is sometime T2. Which one took longer? Which, which displacement, the one on the left or the one on the right, represents the ball being in the air longer? The one on the right, T2. Right, the ball had to go all the way up and come back down. That's a longer time than the one on the left. So keep in mind, the player is going to the highest point of their jump. But we said nothing about the ball. So we don't know whether the ball is on the way up or on the way down. However, I could have been really interesting and asked this problem of, you want to jump so that you touch the ball on the way up, or you want to jump so that you touch the ball on the way down. And then you would need to know, how do you know if the ball is going up or if it's going down? Velocity. velocity, right? You would need to use your velocity equation. So up, up versus down is a velocity question, not a displacement question. So over here, V is up. And over here, V is down. So it's often very important to do both what I would call the motion sketch and the displacement sketch. And that'll often let you know if you need to add in the velocity equation. Because if you're dealing with up versus down, you need to worry about velocity. Now the player. is starting at two and a half meters at t equals zero. Notice this is a case where at the beginning, so the police car case, we were at the same point when we started. Here we're at two different points. You now have a choice. You can change the problem and do everything from that height if you want. And then this distance in here is one meter. Or you can do everything from the ground, which is how it was given. Doesn't matter. Now, I sit around and wait. And during the delay time, so this is all for the ball. For the player, delta x during the time that I'm going to delay is 0. That's what it means to delay. I don't move anywhere. I wait, I wait, I wait, and then I jump. And I have a delta x for my player of during that time that I'm jumping. And to catch the ball, we need to hit the same point at the same time. And I also know that that time t, running out of room a little bit here, 
right? If I draw the player, the player just does that. They're going to the top of their jump. And v equals 0 after time t because they hit the top of their jump. I can't quite fit all three pictures on, but these three pictures represent all the information you need to solve the problem. This is as complicated as it gets. Just to give you an idea, and we'll solve this on Friday, this is probably at the edge of being more complicated than would be in an exam, but close. See you Friday.